So today we want to talk about the e-myth. What's the e-myth? Well, the e-myth, the entrepreneurial myth, is based on this idea. Just because you're good at the technical work of your business, just because you're a good accountant or realtor or uh, advisor, just because you're a good tradesperson, an electrician, plumber, et cetera, just because you're good at the technical work of your business doesn't mean you're good at the business of your technical work. So you're good as a tradesperson, great, great as a, a professional, but it's the business part that is the hard part. And so that's what the e -myth is all about. And the short version of this is that uh, you've spent so much time getting your training and certification to become a lawyer or an accountant or an electrician or a plumber. And yet in all of that time, you never had any business training. And so that's what we wanna unpack today. Um, on the next slide, I'm gonna show you, it's about a seven, eight minute video. Uh, it does a great job of unpacking. In fact, it covers more in seven, eight minutes than I could do. Uh, some of the language is probably would be better if it was uh, a little less unsavory, but uh, it makes the point. So if, you, if it's okay, let's just look past that and uh, I'll get this started. How do you can Within the first five years, 80% of businesses fail. Why is it that we live in an information age with almost all the information needed to succeed available for free, 80% of businesses are still failing. The e-myth is that most people who start businesses are entrepreneurs risking capital to make a profit, when in reality, most people who start a business are technicians, people who are good at an aspect of their job and decided to start their own show. The fatal assumption is that if you understand the technical work of a business, you understand a business that does that technical work. This is not true. There's a lot that goes on with a business that the technician will not understand. The issue is that most people set up their businesses as people dependent when they need to be systems dependent, which means setting up systems and procedures that require people with the minimum amount of skill to keep it operating at a high level. In this summary, we're going to cover how the turnkey revolution is changing business forever, the three roles you have to play to succeed in business, and the three stages of a business. Turnkey business is the act of setting up your business so that you have systems and processes set up for a consistent, effective, and orderly way of doing business day in, day out, so that the business is systems dependent and not people dependent. The real product you're selling is your business, not the product that your business sells to consumers. When setting up a turnkey operation, make sure you're documenting all the steps and processes that go into marketing, creating new products, sales, bookkeeping, everything. The goal of the turnkey operation is to build your business into a franchise. The importance of creating a franchisable business is that you won't be forced to stay in it forever. At some point, you're going to die, and if you're not systems dependent, eventually what you built will collapse. When creating a franchise, you need to have beginning-to-end systems set up for what to do at every stage of the business and solutions to all problems that will crop up. The model must provide consistent value to your customers, employees, and lenders. It must be operated by people with the lowest necessary level of skill. It sounds heartless, but you have to make people expendable, including yourself. Everything you do in your business must be able to be documented in the operations manual. Everyone who goes into business has to play the role of three people, the entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician. The entrepreneur is the visionary who thinks ahead and makes plans for the future. The manager establishes order in the workplace, trying to create consistency. And the technician, the worker and the doer, is the person who does all the technical work. Most people are technicians turned business owners, which means they were really good at their job and they decided they would be better off owning their own shop. Everyone's more suited to one aspect or the other, and each has its own advantages and disadvantages. But in order to be a good business owner, you need all three in the same amount. You need to be able to do the technical work in the beginning to cut costs, be able to manage and train other employees, and be able to take risks and have a plan for the future. In order to run a successful business, sometimes you'll have to give up your main skill to someone else and allow yourself the time it'll take to plan for the future and control the goings-on by managing others and not so much doing all the work on your own. There are three stages of a business, infancy, adolescence, and maturity. The infancy stage is where the business operates on what the owner wants rather than what the business needs to grow and succeed. This stage ends when the owner can't keep up with demand and supply or quality drops. The end of this stage is where businesses either fail or succeed. Infancy ends when the boss realizes things cannot continue the way they have been. If you're still only a technician, this is where many people decide to walk away. 
The adolescent stage is where you've decided to let your business grow and it begins to reach outside of your comfort zone. For the technician, it's more work than you're comfortable doing on your own. For the manager, it's more subordinates than you're comfortable managing. And for the entrepreneur, how many managers can he keep motivated to heading towards the vision? When you're in this stage, be careful not to fall into the management by abdication trap, where you start to hire people who work on the business for you, where you take yourself out and don't pay attention to what their struggles are. Often, the people you hire don't do the work to the level you want them to, and you end up reverting back to the infancy stage, doing everything on your own. If you can expand your comfort zone to increase your ability to handle the expansion, you'll enter into the maturity stage. The maturity stage means your business has a clear vision and purpose. The owner must handle the entrepreneurial aspect of running a business by hiring managers to follow the vision of the company and to manage the technicians who are doing the work. You're not supposed to work in your business, but on it here, figuring out exactly who the customers you serve are and how you can add more value to their lives. When you have a mature business, you can really focus on creating an impact. In order to run a successful business, you can't remain just a technician. You can't hire people to build your business for you and hope they get it right. You need to focus on making the business everything you want it to become. You need to take the time to make it systems dependent so you aren't relying on any one person, including yourself. Be equal parts technician, manager, and entrepreneur. Realize that you will be in the mature stage of a business when you have a clear vision of the future in place and an operations manual built around every aspect of your business. This business development process can be applied to any business in any industry and can absolutely take the load off of you being the main salesperson, marketer, bookkeeper, designer, product developer, and so on. You don't want to be doing everything. You may need to do these things to start, but focus on finding the right people for the jobs that can be delegated and fire yourself in these positions. So that's an awesome summary of the book. Um, and uh, some of you may be wondering why would I want to franchise my business? Um, the uh, purpose, Michael Gerber, the author of the book, doesn't say that you literally want to franchise your business unless you want to, but what it takes to franchise a business, to have the systems, tools, and strategies in place that someone else will pay you for is the equivalent of getting a business that gives you time and money freedom. And so what does that mean? Well, let me ask you a th rhetorical theoretical question. How do they get those French fries to taste the same? Whether they're made in Moscow or Hong Kong or your hometown, the French fries are made by a 16 year old and the parents of that 16 year old can't get him or her to clean their bedroom. How do they do that? They have great systems. So McDonald's does that because they can train any 16 year old how to follow their process, how to follow their recipe. In fact, they've even systematized the production of potatoes, as I understand it. It's a system and that system then can be reproduced time and time and time again. Uh, and that's how they make that work. And then uh, Ray Kroc, you know, the guy who founded or was the guy who initially built McDonald's into what it is today, doesn't have to be in every single restaurant to make that work. Um, and so let's unpack a little bit of what that means. If the owner wants a better business, first the business needs a better one of those. If the owner wants a better business, first the business needs a better owner. And here's the take, here's the uh, breakout of what uh, they talk about in the EMF. Systems run your business. People run your systems and you lead your people. So you can see the order of priority here. Systems run your business, people run your systems, you lead your people. And it starts with systems because if people run your business as people come and go, so does your business. Your business will fluctuate on the strength or availability of the people that you've hired. Uh, and if you've got great people, that'll likely work. Uh, but the difficulty with that is that ultimately that system, that methodology fails because you know here's the thing if you're the captain of a boat in the navy let's say it's 50 feet and you've got a crew of 10 well you can meet every one of those crew twice a day and you can communicate your expectations that communicate what needs to be done now let's make you the captain of a 150 foot boat and uh, and now there's 50 people well now it's much more difficult to meet everyone in the business, everyone on the boat every day to communicate their expectations down to the individual person level. It's not possible to do that anymore. So how do you replace your, um, your contact with each of these people 
the system is what becomes your replacement. And that's how you know how people are behaving um, uh, with your customers and behaving with uh, each other. And part of that system, by the way, is the culture that you create as a business owner. So then you get great systems, you have great people that run that system, and then your job then is to lead those people and to become good at leadership, communication, and delegation. Because here's the thing, your business, about 80, 85% of what happens in a business ought to be routine, ought to be the system, ought to, uh, you know, the work that gets done in a predictable, repeatable, robust way. And uh, so 80, 85% of what happens in a business is routine. So you systematize the routine, humanize the exception. So if anything happens that's not within the boundaries, within the lane, so to speak, of the routine, well, then it rises to the level of a human, a person who intervenes to, to create a solution or to answer or solve the problem. But here's the thing, as soon as that happens, your next question you'd want to ask is, what would the system have to be so that couldn't happen again? How can I design the system so that would now become part of the routine of how we deal things? So we don't look for people solutions, we look for system solutions that people can then operate. Um, and so uh, this is Ken Blanchard, he wrote a great book called The One Minute Manager. And uh, the, the point that he's making here is what so many business owners think of delegation. When they delegate, what they actually are doing is abdicating. And what that means is business owners are either too involved, micromanaging, or not involved, abdicating. And it's that ground in between that causes lots, so many business owners to think, well, I can't get good people and I can't get them to do the work at the level I need. And that's partly because you probably don't have a great culture and partly because you have to learn a skill. And that's called delegating. And delegating is this idea of I'm going to ask someone to do an activity or a task. I'm going to do, I'm going to explain the outcomes that I'm looking for, and then I'm going to provide the right level of training and support to, to, um, to give them what they need in order to get to an outcome. And you can see on the right hand, I've got a little bit of a scale that goes from one to 10. It might be a little tough to read, but there's 10 shades of gray when it comes to um, uh, how much you subordinate or how much authority you give someone in a job. So at level one, it's wait to be told, do exactly what I say. A couple of steps up from that. Number five, give me your analysis of the situation, i.e. reasons, options, pros, cons, etc. And then I'll decide. And then at level nine, it's decide and take action. You don't need to check with me. So you can see that what our goal is as owners, as, as leaders, is to get someone from you know, the early stages, one, two, or three, through to a place where they've effectively taken over that part of their responsibility and they can do it at the level that you're entirely satisfied each time. So, uh, and here's the other thing that sometimes gets confusing. You may have someone working with you who does, who's at a level nine or 10 in three dimensions of their job, and now you give them a fourth one, and the mistake that often gets made is that we assume they're going to immediately be operating at level nine. Well, how could that be? They haven't had yet the experience or the training or you haven't coached them and you haven't given them the support. And then it causes confusion because, hey, in this area, you're treating me like a 10. In this area, you're treating me like a baby. You're micromanaging. I don't get it. And so this part of the, the skill of learning to delegate is that we communicate expectations clearly both in the things that this person does extremely well and in the things that this person is now leveling up to get to a place where they're uh, eight, nine, or 10. And my suggestion to you is that you take this, this, this um, grade skill uh, and actually share it with your team. Hey, I see you as an eight on this thing. What do you think? Oh, I'm a five. Oh, well, let's, let's talk about that. Let's get that sorted out. Or more regularly, what will happen is, uh, hey, I see you as a five, the micromanager, and, you know, your guy is going to be saying, I'm a 10. Oh, well, that causes, you know, of course, that's where there's going to be conflict and uh, tension because the expectations are not uh, universally understood. So how do you get the right people doing the right things right <clears throat> when we're talking about systems, we're talking about uh, hiring and so on? So the first part of getting the right people doing the right things right is getting making sure everybody's on the same page. 
does everyone share? Are they aligned on vision, mission, culture? Do we have a strategic plan that outlines what we're looking to do, how we're going to grow and scale the business? What does success look like? Let's put the foundations into place, vision, mission, culture. Then how do we treat people? Well, here's what people need uh, as support around them, an organization chart and position description so everybody in the organization knows who's responsible for what and how what I'm responsible fits with the person next to me. And then we want to give them some feedback so they know what they're doing well and what we're looking to improve, so performance appraisals. And then line, let's line up their um, objectives, their goals to line up with ours, so why not have some kind of performance incentives or bonuses or commissions or some way that rewards people, uh, informs them what it, we're expecting from them, sell so much of this or answer the phone before that or get this gross margin so that they get bonused on the things that matter to us and so their goals become our goals. Um, that we need proper communication so there's a, a place for daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly and annual meetings. Some of you are probably thinking, oh my God, there's no way. And if that's the case, that's uh, exactly why you need a team meeting rhythms. If you've got some questions about why that matters or how to do it or what would even be the point, feel free to join me uh, after this call or at some other place down the road later on, I'll explain how to do that. And then team building systems so that we understand each other's behavioral styles, communication styles, what motivates each other and specifically how to pull together a team. And then the management strategy, which is around each person, you would want each person to have an action plan. What's their part of the mission when it comes to the strategic plan? Key performance indicators, KPIs, how do I know myself on a day-to-day -day basis? How do I get feedback in some kind of numeric or metric way that lets me know without anyone telling me if I'm doing a good job? And then uh, we talked about standard operating procedures or how do they make those French fries? What's the system and process? Well, that's what an operation manual is meant to uh, uh, declare or uh, to make clear. Uh, how do we make those French fries? And when you have all of that put together, you're gonna have the right people doing the right things right. And so, you know, how does coaching help you with that? Um, so basically when I think of coaching, it's three things. So first of all, it's business growth, it's personal growth. And that's, as we've been talking about leadership, communication, delegation, and then it's about performance, your performance and that of the team. And that's usually around holding you accountable. Uh, when it comes to business growth, there's a, a five-step process. I'm gonna help business owners work their way through. Let me just quickly walk through that. So. Uh, level one is, is pre-revenue. You're trying to figure out who am I going to be in the marketplace? What's my positioning? What's my point of difference? We launch the business and then there's a wobble as we try to find our footing and some things are working and some things aren't. At level three, uh, you, the business is starting to get profitable and now we're scaling for growth. The control stage, this is really when uh, the e-myth and all of what we learn, this is when we're establishing the franchise model. Uh, at the prosperity stage, the owner is doing really well. Business is thrown off profit. The owner is happy uh, and involved in the business every day. And lots of owners are happy at this stage. Uh, it'd be like owning the McDonald's restaurant and going to the restaurant every day. And others say, hey, I want time and money freedom. Level five is where you have uh, the freedom to spend your time as you wish and the money to do that. And that could be opening another restaurant or opening up another office or um, spending your time on the golf course. The, the point is you get to, you get to choose. Um, typically, the kinds of things you might be struggling with is around time, team, or money. You might be saying things like, I've got too much to do and not enough time to do it. I can't get everything done. If I don't do it, I won't get done. Um, team is, how do I get them to work at the right level? How do I get the culture I want? And then money's got both the two dimensions to it. One is counting the money, uh, you know, having accounting in place, having a dashboard, having metrics, KPIs, so I can measure results. And the other side of money, is, of course, is I need more money. I need better sales and marketing. And we do, um, and so stepping, moving aside from that, then let's talk about personal growth. We said the business needs to have a better owner. When we think about who am I, the only thing we ever get to see with people is what they say and do, observable behavior. And by physiology, I'm talking about tone of voice, body language, perspiration, that kind of thing. That's what drives results. On the input side, your background skills and knowledge and those informed by your goals, but for all of us, it goes through a filter. 
That filter is known as our mindset. And today I'm gonna to suggest that mindset's made up of those five components. I wanna talk about one of them. What's the first three words that come to mind when I say the word money? What's the first three words that come to mind for you? Take a pen, write it down. Well, what is money? You know, the dictionary says money is an abstract concept backed by confidence. And what that really means is that money isn't anything except what we believe to be true about it. Um, and so many of us on the call, when we think of money, we think about spending, we might think about saving, we might think about investing, we might think about not enough, how do I get more? Those are all beliefs. Those are all things that we believe to be true about money, but isn't necessarily the case. Let me explain what I mean. So an employee who thinks about earning a salary, their word, their way of thinking about it is they put in exchange for some of their time, they uh, get paid or earn some income. A self-employed person makes money. So they actually produce money out of thin air. So entirely different way of thinking about money. An owner thinks about receiving profits from a third party entity known as their business. And that's when you're operating at the entrepreneur level in your business. An investor thinks about a return on investment. And at the entrepreneur level, well, Warren Buffett doesn't work for money. Money works for him. So what do I mean by that? Think about uh, the, uh, the you know, you know, the average middle class person thinks the purpose of money is to spend. And everyone knows the story of the guy who wins the lottery. And five years later, that guy is broke. Everybody knows that story because we hear it all the time. And that, that's because if you give that person with that money mindset, a lot of money, they're just going to spend it all because that's what you do with money. Whereas Warren Buffett, he'd have an entirely different thought. We can all imagine what that would be. He'd say, how do I put this money to work? Now, here's the real thing I want you to get from this. Many of us don't own a business. We have a business that's got our brand and maybe we sign the papers. But for many of us, we actually own a job in our business. We're actually, in a way, operate as if we're self-employed in our business. And as long as you have that mindset about your business, you'll continue to be the technician. And it's how do I find the high wire act, the balance between operating as a technician and slowly uh, delegating more and more and more of those responsibilities until I'm operating the ship as if I'm the captain. And then at the personal performance side is I'll help uh, business owners do better quality push-ups than that guy's doing and almost certainly more push-ups than you're doing on your own. Here's the thing I know, no matter how much willpower or discipline you have, or in fact, for that matter, I have, none of us have enough. It's a myth. Willpower and discipline only take you so far and it's easily exhausted. Even in a single day, the willpower you have at eight o'clock is gonna look way different than the willpower you have at four o'clock. And so here's the thing, I drink my own Kool-Aid, I know, that when I say and commit to my coach that I'm gonna get stuff done, um, the last thing I'm gonna let happen is wake up on the day of my call and think, oh crap, I better get my homework done because I do not wanna walk into that meeting and have to make up a bunch of stories about why I didn't get done. So the same thing happens for you. The way to get from one set of habits to another set of habits is to build in some systems or structure. And part of that is accountability. So here is the last point that I want to make. What is the purpose of your business? What is the purpose of your business? Well, so a lot of people are going to give you a bunch of different ideas about that. Uh, and if you're a 50 million, 100 million, billion dollar business, this definition I'm going to offer you isn't going to be applicable. But ultimately, the purpose of your business, the people on this call, the purpose of your business is to give you, you the owner, the life you want. And what I mean by that is none of us were born to business. We were born to live. And so your business ought to be a vehicle that gives you that life. And so the first part of all of the work I do with clients is what do you want out of your life? When we're clear about that, what do you want? Or how do we design your business so that ultimately it gives you that life? And if you feel like your business is giving you that life, awesome. Congratulations. If you're feeling like, you know, there are parts of my life that are not as good as I want to be, well, maybe there's a reason for us to uh, have a call. If you have questions, I'd love to answer them. You're probably in one of three places. So maybe you're at the end of this, you're like, hey, I'm good. I got this. Thanks a lot. Got a couple of tips. If that's the case, awesome. I'm, I'm actually very happy for you. And in fact, uh, 
um, uh, impressed with your success. Uh, number two is you might be in a place where you think, hey, I'm pretty good with this, but I have a question or two. And if that's okay, if that's the case for you, then feel free to go to timewithjohn.com. I'm happy to answer, no obligation. I'm happy to talk to you for 15 minutes and have a chat about or answer that question or how to do this or how to do that. And third, you might be in a place where you're thinking, you know what, I need some help with this. Um, and uh, because I'm struggling in, in this or some other areas of my business. And if that's you, again, let's go to timewithjohn.com. Let's have a chat about what you're experiencing in the business. And if it feels like a fit, we'll go ahead and book out an hour, have a longer discovery call. Uh, and if at the end of that, it feels like we're a fit, we'll talk about how we might uh, fit, how we might work together.